So welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar. So we're very pleased this afternoon to have Steve Boeing from the University of Leeds and Gordon Gibb from EPCC, who are going to give today's webinar based on the work that was carried out on uh, the recent ECSE project. So if you have any questions, the best thing to do is to type them into the chat and uh, we'll try and keep an eye on them during the webinar. And then there'll be time for questions at the end anyway. So Stephen and Gooden's webinar today is entitled A Fully Lagrangian Dynamic Core for the Met Office NERC Cloud Model. So I'm going to hand over to, to Steve now. Thank you. So what I'm presenting today is work we did on a, a code. And the code simulates um, atmospheric dynamics. And in particular, we use it to simulate clouds. And in fact, these are idealized clouds. So that's what you see on this first picture. You see three clouds. One of them is done with our, our most recent uh, code, which is all based on parcels. So the cloud is fully represented by parcels. And the other two, the two on the right, uh, they use a traditional large eddy simulation approach. Uh, so in past work we have compared these approaches and we've seen that these these parcels that they're a very effective way of representing clouds um, but the code we had wasn't parallel and so today's seminar is about a project we did and it was a collaboration between um, EPCC so Nick Brown and Michelle and Gordon of course are um, involved in this um, University of St. Andrews, David Ritchell, who did a lot of the development work on the original code, and the University of Leeds, so Doug Parker and Alan Blight are my collaborators here, and we've been involved in, in building in the um, moist dynamics and also part of this parallelization effort. Um, so what I'll be talking about, so first give a bit of an overview of the code. Um, and also talk about uh, the Met Office NERC cloud model. So that is the grid-based model of which you saw results on the previous slide. But it's also the parallelization framework which we used um, during this project. So you can think of, of what we've been doing as stripping the, the Met Office model and building in our parcel dynamics. Then Gordon will take over and he'll talk about the design and performance of the code and also some practical aspects like the repository, the installation of the code and how to add your own components to it. And then we'll finish up with some conclusions and some ideas about our future work. Um, so this was an ECZ project which was funded um, about two years ago. Uh, and it was to, to build this fully Lagrangian dynamical core. So when I say fully Lagrangian, it's based on parcels. So if you think about traditional atmospheric codes, most of them, they're fully Eulerian, grid-based, but what's sometimes done because of advection is more, can be more efficient in another way, is that a semi-Lagrangian advection scheme is used. So what's done then is departure points are used. So you, you calculate the flow fields, and then you look at departure field the points, uh, advect, and then regrid the, the resulting fields and use that to, um, to progress the simulation. Uh, what we're doing here is something which is slightly different in the sense that it's essentially Lagrangian. All the prognostics in this code are on parcels. And the, a grid is used when we solve the fluid dynamics equations, but it's only used to calculate velocities. And then that field is no longer used as a, as a prognostic. The, the parcels really represent the entire state of the, of the flow. Um, now, what we compare it against is atmospheric large eddy simulation. So these are uh, models for the atmosphere that are used, and they resolve most of the dynamics um, of the flow. But um, the smaller scale turbulence in such a simulation is parameterized, it can be resolved. Um, and an example of this is indeed this uh, Monk model, 
Uh, now, clouds are particularly interesting as a fluid dynamics problem because evaporation and condensation takes place. And the way this is represented in the equations is as a discontinuity. Um, the picture you see on this slide, that's what you can think of as what our simulation would, would look like. So you see a cube, which is the underlying grid, which is used uh, for the solver. And then all the blobs are these parcels that are um, advected by the flow. Um, so the reason we do this is if you think about fluid dynamics and about the way we typically express the, the equations, is that very naturally you express things in a Lagrangian way. For example, if you think about mass or some more atmospheric variables like potential temperature, they are typically conserved along fluid trajectories, or in this case, uh, parcels. However, if you think about something else which you'll need to, to evolve the flow, for example, the pressure, um, then that's where the communication takes place. And especially in an incompressible code, which is what, what we're doing here, you need to solve the entire field through inversion. So that's more naturally Lagrangian. Um, so both of these aspects, we try to combine them here in an optimal way. So what we do is we represent the continuum by a set of discrete parcels. So they represent the clouds, but they also represent the surroundings of the clouds. And they carry a number of attrib attributes. So a temperature, uh, in particular, we use this temperature BL, which is conserved. It's conserved under pressure changes and under phase changes. So if, as a parcel moves up and down the atmosphere, um, this BL is conserved. Uh, and specific humidity, which is both water vapor and liquid water. Um, the other attribute which uh, um, a parcel has is vorticity. Um, so the prototype equations you see uh, below, there's a momentum equation, uh, there's this conserved uh, temperature and specific humidity, and the flow is incompressible. Um, the way we solve it is we solve this as a dimensionless system in, in this code, but we're now also looking at how can we use it in the atmosphere, in which case we'll uh, have to move to, to variables which are uh, dimensional because that's a lot easier in terms of interpreting the, um, the simulations. So how do we deal with phase transitions? Uh, so in the momentum equation, you see the buoyancy. And this buoyancy is a combination of the this, conserved potential temperature, BL, but there's a correction, and that correction is due to phase transition, to the presence of liquid water. So that is QL. Uh, and liquid water itself, um, this is where the nonlinearity comes in. That depends on the amount of moisture that's available. If there's, uh, if there's little moisture available, you won't for be forming a cloud. And Secondly, it also um, depends on the so-called saturation uh, specific humidity. And this QS is a function of height. Uh, in reality, it's a function of pressure and temperature in the atmosphere. But to a good approximation, the main dependence is a, is a height dependence. Uh, and this is because you only have liquid water if you pass this threshold of the saturation specific humidity, there's a nonlinearity in the equation. Um, and as a result, you'll see that in, if you look at, say, the liquid water field here, to the left you see the moist uh, parcel in cell method, and to the right you see monk, that there's a, a large area where there's no liquid water at all, and then there's a very sharp transition, and in the case of MPIC, it's even very sharp. Uh, to a region where there is a, a large amount of uh, liquid water present. Uh, what you see here, this is from previous work, uh, where we didn't have the parallel code, is that the moist parcel in cell methods uh, contains a lot of fine scale structure. Um, so numerically, 
This is done by even the vorticity and the parcel position uh, using a Rumskuta uh, scheme. And that means that for vorticity, we also need to have an equation. So position is just uh, vectored along um, with the velocity fields. Uh, and this equation is written in flux form. Um, and there are these, hey, it's a, it's a vector. Uh, and what you see here is that the, the right hand side of the equation also involves uh, vectors. Uh, but in particular, you see that the velocity comes into this equation to evolve the vorticity. So also for that reason, we need to uh, construct the velocity fields. And we do that using a grid. In particular, we construct it from the vorticity, which is on the parcels. And the way that's done, it's a lot like a traditional large eddy simulation model, as in it uses a Poisson solver. But rather than a Poisson solver for a scalar, which is what you typically have for a, uh, a pressure field, we use a so-called vector Poisson solver. Um, and the equation you get, you get it from assuming that the velocity, or from saying the velocity is the curl of this, um, this field A, this vector field A, and then you get a, this, this equation, which is the vector Poisson equation, which relates the vector potential um, to the vorticity. And once you have this vector potential, you can derive the velocity again. Uh, there are some more subtleties in our, um, and the paper that, that uh, David wrote on this with, with us as, uh, as co-authors that talks about how to exactly also ensure the vorticity is divergence free. Um, so, in principle, these parcels, they, we can have them without having mixing, but that's not realistic. Eventually, in the atmosphere, and you create turbulence, and the turbulence ensures that eventually on the smaller scales uh, you will get mixing. So, but the first step to mixing is that parcels start to stretch and deform. So we explicitly uh, calculate that in, in MPIC um, by looking at the, uh, the tendency of, of stretching. It's explicit as in it gives a measure of the amount of, of stretching. And eventually, we split a parcel into smaller parcels, um, depending on the evolution of the, the vorticity. Uh, so when you have this splitting, uh, one of the old uh, parcels is, is kept, and then a new parcel is uh, created with an offset in its position. So both the old and the new parcel, they have the same properties, but they need to change position. Now, once this, this has happened a couple of times, so you get uh, one parcel creating two parcels, creating four. Um, when they become too small, the parcels are merged in their, uh, into their surrounding parcels using a conservative operation on the grid. So, so this was the, the code we had. Uh, and initially, we built this using uh, OpenMP, so shared memory parallelism. Uh, but the big issue with that is that limit the size of the problem that can be addressed. So we have done problems as, as big as 384 uh, cubed on the grid with that. Um, but it also becomes very slow at that point. And high performance computing is going in the direction of ever uh, larger machines, but with distributed memory. So what we wanted to do is implement hybrid parallelism. So both uh, MPI and OpenMP. And what we needed to consider for that is change of parcel position, which happens during advection, but also during splitting, as we just saw. Uh, the merging of parcels, which is a local operation as well, and the vector Poisson solver, and that's a global problem. But for this vector Poisson solver, um, efficient algorithms exist, and the Metaphysner cloud model already included an efficient algorithm to do that. Uh, 
Uh, so that was why we decided, or one of the reasons we decided to use that framework. Um, in particular, something to think about in our parallelism is that we have a lot more parcel data than grid data, and the Poisson solver uses the grid, so that's, that's not as large an amount of data. Uh, but the parcel data have the uh, advantage that all the communication there is relatively local. It's not a global problem involved. Um, so the framework for parallelization that we use, Monk, it's a very high resolution and flexible uh, cloud modeling framework. And it's been developed over the past, I think, five, maybe six, seven years. And it's been a collaboration between uh, the Metas, ANCAS, EPCC, and a number of UK universities. Uh, so it was based on a, a code that the Metas had, the large eddy model, uh, which has, has been around since the 1980s. But the parallelism in the large eddy model was limited to about 500 cores. Um, whereas now, uh, with Monk, we can go up to several tens of thousands of cores. Uh, it's in Fortran 2003. It has a modular structure, uh, and it has leapfrog time integration, which is different from MPIC, which uses a rubbish scheme. Uh, so the parallelism in Monk is in the x and the y dimension, so not in the vertical, and that's also the way we've done it for MPIC. Uh, so that means you have columns, and each process uh, must have at least one column. Uh, but the number of columns per process doesn't need to be the same for each, uh, uh, for each computing unit. And with respect to uh, the large eddy model, which only used uh, decomposition in one direction, can now really use much bigger parallel machines. Um, and the MPI is asynchronous. It includes an uh, FFT solver. So FFTW is used. But there are others as well. We haven't tested those. Um, but it, it would be something in future to uh, to look at iterative solvers, for example, especially as, as Gordon will come back to this. The FFT seems to be the biggest bottleneck in, in terms of uh, how far we can push performance at the moment. Uh, there's an I.O. server in Monk, also something that's not currently used for the, for, uh, the parallel version of Ampic, but something to look at in, in future. And it scales on up to about 30,000 cores, which is also similar to what we'll find. Um, so Monk is divided into a model core and several components. And the model core uh, really um, focuses on functionality. It's, it contains the state of the model. Uh, it handles. Uh, um, some of the, the utilities, but most of the work is actually done in these components. And those are independent. They have all have a similar format. So there's an action which is uh, associated with initialization. There's a, an action associated with each time step and one when the, the model finishes. It's managed by a registry. Uh, and it's fairly easy to just add a new component for, for testing. So this is just showing the uh, different workflow in MPIC on the left and Monk on the right. So in MPIC, initialize the parcels. And then there's a time step loop within it, uh, an RK4 loop. Uh, and within the time step uh, loop, some of the actions are done every sub time step. But splitting and, and merging is only done every full time step. And the same thing goes for output. Um, whereas in Monk, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly similar, but the time step is a little bit easier because of uh, this leapfrog. Um, so to design this new parallel MPEG code, uh, 
uh, we applied for an ECZ project, of which, well, this is the, uh, the, the outcome of that, that ECZ. Uh, and really, we thought we can harness as much of uh, Monk's parallelism as possible. Uh, the Poisson solver was already there. Uh, and with parcels, we were also thinking, should we do something else as domain decomposition? Because the number of parcels per subdomain rather than, than bit points, it will vary. Uh, now, currently, we've just used domain decomposition. Um, but we can imagine that uh, if you look at uh, simulations where you do really get clustering of, of parcels, for example, because you choose to create more parcels in part of the domain, uh, that something else would be needed as well. Um, the Lagrangian diagnostics, they can also feed back into standard mock. It's not something we've done uh, at this point, but it would be something to explore. And um, the thing about uh, Monk is that it also comes with a, a component testing framework. I think this is the point where Gordon will take over and tell you a bit more about the uh, uh, about the ECZ project and things we found during the project. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as Steve just said, um, we basically decided we would implement um, the MPIC code into Monk's framework because Monk had this nice framework which we could use and take advantage of. Um, so we basically took a stripped down version of the um, Monk model core and then built on top of this to create this, this new code that we called parallel moist parcel in cell or PMPIC. Um, this new code is, is not compatible with the other Monk components um, because our version is parcel aware and the old Monk ones are not. Uh, and we have several different types of structures in place. We have an RK4 time step. Uh, we solve a different set of equations. Um, however, we can use some of the functionality that Monk has built in, such as fast Fourier transforms, its grids, um, and how its parallelism works. Um, and this is stored in a Git repository, uh, which there should be a link to somewhere. It is on the Archer website anyway, um, and it's just built with a simple make file. So there, there's no complicated make system um, in place to make it work. So first of all, when we were looking into how to do this, the first thing we that we had to consider was how do we represent parcels? Um, yep, yeah, uh, Steve just sent a link to uh, the GitHub. Uh, so yeah, so we uh, first thought, how do you want to represent parcels with this um, code? Because there are two different ways. You can either have um, a set of arrays for each parcel property. So for example, um, the velocity in X, Y, Z, the vorticity, um, the, uh, the buoyancy and, and various other things. So separate arrays for each one, or we could have a parcel derived data type where for each parcel, we have all of the information next to each other. And then just so simply one array of these derived data types, which, um, come across as being a bit more elegant to actually implement. However, uh, when we did some testing um, of this, we discovered that um, they were much slower um, in both the main um, grid to parcel and parcel to grid interpolation routines. So this graph we have on the screen here basically just shows you the, um, the mean time to carry out such an operation. Um, for the derived data types and the arrays, and the arrays are slower, uh, sorry, are faster in both cases. So we stuck with these. Uh, some other design choices we had to make was, so as Steve said, before Monk uses a uh, leapfrog integrator, most MPIC uses a fourth order Runga cutter. Um, so we had to modify the uh, Monk model core so that it could, um, so it, it was capable of having a, a sort of sub loop, which went round four times uh, to take account for the Runga cutter. 
Um, this has a higher memory footprint because you have to store all the, um, the intermediate parcel values. Um, we are working on a, low st uh, on a lower storage version of this. Um, and also in terms of, um, for the output, um, how, how would we go about doing this? So uh, first, we just implemented a basic binary dump where you just dump all the parcels, um, all their data into a binary file. Uh, and we've also implemented a net CDF, um, a parallel net CDF um, version. So you can write data, um, though grids only, because of the sheer size of parcel files, um, grids only to net CDF files. Um, so though uh, Monk has halo swapping um, there, this is for this is for the grids, not for parcels. We had to write our, our own parcel um, halo swapping routines. Um, so um, in order to do this, we um, yeah we we basically managed to figure out some way of doing this and make sure that we can um, backfill and do other such things. So we have at the bottom here it's just some example of we started up some some run which has four four processes and just tag the parcels based on the process which they begin in. Then we have some rotational flow to move these parcels. So they essentially move in between processes. And then we just check and make sure that um, this looks like what it should look like. So you can see here that as has rotated, the parcels um, have been transferred correctly. Uh, so we also had to implement the um, fourth order compact central differencing um, triadiagonal solver um, to solve for the uh, vorticity and velocity fields. Um, so this is just showing a test with um, an average correct value and the numbers that um, our code generates. So as you can see, these seem to match quite well. Uh, so um, once the code was written, uh, we wanted to compare it against the old one. So first we had just looked at single node comparison because um, the original code only scaled to a single node. Um, so in the uh, first graph on the left, um, we have um, the original code MPIC, which is in gray, and then um, the parallel MPIC, um, where, where we're in blue, where we're using MPI processes, and, R, and in orange, where we're using um, open MP threads. Um, so you can see that um, in terms of the threaded version of PMPIC, this is not as per, not this doesn't scale as well as um, as the original MPIC. However, the MPI version scales better. Um, you can see it's basically a linear scaling up to, or an, an ideal scaling up to four um, processes, and it tails off. This is due to a load imbalance um, because different processes end up having different numbers of um, parcels in them after that. Um, but overall, um, in terms of absolute performance, um, on a single core, the parallel MPIC is 1.6 times faster. So we have to speed up. Um, even in just a single core. Um, the MPI, sorry, the, the open MP scaling um, is probably worse because we focus most on the MPI. However, we could look into tuning more things like chunk size and using static arrays rather than dynamically allocating them because then it may be, it may be able to optimize better. <clears throat> so just um, to look at the um, the breakdown of the times and different routines for a single core, we see that the largest component is running the FFTs, which are required for um, the velocity inversion and um, updating the velocity, um, followed by the interpolation routines, so uh, parcel um, onto the grid and grid onto the parcel, uh, mixing and splitting as well which also actually mostly have a lot of interpolation in them. Um, so this is just a good thing to keep in note is 
to a considerate as are a considerable proportion of the runtime, roughly a quarter. So then uh, we looked at the performance um, as we scaled to many, many nodes, and we uh, have gone up to uh, almost 50,000 cores, so almost half of Archer's capacity. Um, and the scaling doesn't look great at first glance. Um, so we get a parallel efficiency um, of around about 70% up to 20,000 cores. Um, However, when we consider all of the individual components, so all of the individual parts of the peak code, um, we can see that all of the subcomponents um, scale pretty much ideally, except for the FFTs, which scale very poorly. And it is the FFT um, causing the degradation in scaling as we go to larger core counts. Um, this is not too surprising because Monk also suffers from this whereby it's the FFT solvers which um, do most damage to its performance. Um, so one of the things that we will be looking into um, is changing the, the solvers so they don't use FFTs, because then we should be able to get much better um, scaling of the code. Um, so in terms of the benefits of this work, um, it is the first um, use of this type in atmosphere in the atmos in the atmospheric modeling community. Um, so this hybrid approach with parcels and um, grid, so a uh, mixed Eulerian and Lagrangian code. Um, it's massively parallel, so we can tackle much larger problems than we could previously, um, and you could even start looking at some problems. Um, it represents an alternative approach for the Monk community. So this code does um, much similar to what Monk does, but does it in a slightly different way. So we can look at these and compare them. Um, and it could prove the basis for having Lagrangian diagnostics in the Monk code. This is currently lacking. Uh, and this code is under the BSD license. In terms of if we want to use this code, it's reasonably simple. So uh, you're a parallel launcher. We have MPI exec here, but it could easily be AP run if you're an archer. Um, then dash n2, your, your, your number of cores, monk. And then dash dash config equals config.mcf, where config.mcf is a basic configuration file, which I'll talk about um, in the next slide or two. Um, in terms of its dependencies, it doesn't have that many. There's MPI. Uh, which will hopefully be satisfied in, on any HPC machine. Um, there's FFTW, um, and there is an optional um, dependency for NetCDF for if you wish to build it with the parallel NetCDF um, file writer. Um, it works with the GNU and Cray compilers. We haven't tested this Intel compiler. Um, however, I'd be surprised if it didn't work. Okay, so for the basic test case that we have um, in the GitHub repository, um, it's of a spherical um, moist plume, which is more buoyant than its surroundings. So it starts to, to rise up and then condense and form a cloud. Um, this is one of the reasons why the parallel um, performance after cores didn't do so well on a single node, because um, for the first four cores, the particles are evenly distributed. But after that, you get portions where there aren't any, um, where which this plume isn't in, and that area has fewer parcels. Um, okay. So um, in terms of running it, uh, talked about this before. Um, you use your parallel job launcher, your path to the executable, and then your your config file. Uh, this config file basically specifies which components that you want to run and in what order. Uh, and also runtime settings and and parameters, so you know you, your your problem size and some other things. There is also a global config file, which um, has a similar kind of layout to your basic config file, but this um, contains base settings for Monk, and uh, you shouldn't change it unless you know what you're doing. Um, both these config files should be placed in the working directory. Um, the default case um, is quite small, and can you? Can, on, on a laptop, um, I think by default it's set to either 32 cubes or 64 cubes um, grid cells, which runs 
quite quickly, but you can change this number to scale up much larger. Um, one thing to keep a note, because um, because um, PMPIC is parallelized with MPI and OpenMP, if you're running it purely using API processes, you want to ensure that OMP num threads are set to one, else it will try to thread and could slow your system down quite a lot. Um, there's information on the wiki um, on GitHub um, with all of the components uh, and what they do. And I think now we'll talk about uh, first. Yeah, there are some visualization um, routines which can show, uh, which can make images from your results. Um, so firstly, just talk about um, if we look at just the gridded values, this is the image on the left. Uh, you can see this is quite pixelated, quite coarse. This is for 32 cubed. Um, so there's only 32 by 32 pixels in this image. However, if we use the the parcels, uh, then we're able to resolve to have a, a much sharper image, um, which is the one you get on the right. Uh, so you just have much more detail because they can resolve subgrid cell structure. However, your parcel output files are much larger because you have much more data. Uh, so the scripts are um, are included with um, with the MPIC are um, a one script which displays some of the gridded fields. By default, it's buoyancy, but you can go in and change that. Uh, one which displays parcels, which renders an image like the one we saw on the previous slide. Um, a planner.py, which approximates calculates the memory footprint for the code. So this is quite important. So if you're running a large simulation, um, if you run this and tell it the size of your um, size of your computational box, it will tell you the minimum number of nodes which you need to use and some other settings which you may need to set to get optimal performance. Um, Timing.py script basically reads um, timing information which we have um, in the code. I think you have to turn this on in one of the config files. And visualize.py is an older visualization routine uh, which was used for testing at the start. But you can take a look at that and see what it does, see if you can reuse that for anything that you need. Um, so one of the beauties with the Monk framework is you can write your 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 own components um, to do a particular thing and slot them in. So for example, um, to set up your initial conditions, you can create a parcel setup component which places all of the parcels. Uh, so by default, we have this plume parcel setup which produces that, that, that spherical plume. But you can easily go in and create your own component which um, can set up parcels as you like. Uh, so the easiest way to do this is take the basic parcel setup uh, one which we have, which just places parcels in space but doesn't assign any values to them. Uh, make a copy of this um, and, re and rename it to something else. Uh, uh, you then go into this directory, make sure you rename all the files to their new names, <coughs> and make sure that the make file in the subdirectory is modified so it points to these new files. Uh, now you just go into the Fortran source code file for this new component. Uh, make sure you change the the, the names of everything. Uh, for example, so up here, um, there will be this bit right at the top, um, which is a essentially describes this component. So you want to make sure that you've changed all of your names from basic parcel setup to my parcel setup, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then there will be um, uh, subroutine called initialization callback, and uh, what this does is this actually is called when you when you run Monk and sets the parcels up. So you can go in this and change this to what you want to do. Um, and to enable this component um, in your config file, uh, you have to add some line my parcel setup enabled is is equal to true. Also, make sure you disable the other parcel setup components, or they will um, interfere with with each other. Uh, you recompile Monk, and this new component should then be available to use. Uh, as mentioned previously, we also have um, the option to um, use NetCDF, so we write the grid files out to um, to parallel CDF files. Um, 
we do not use this for the parcels because um, especially for larger cases, your parcel dumps can be on the order of several hundreds of gigabytes or even more. Uh, so producing a single file of this size is not very good for transferring it off, off of the machine. So we leave this, each process produces its own, um, its own parcel dump file. Uh, however, we'll look into improving this in, in the future. Um, so when you're on Archer, you just need the Cray HDF5 parallel and Cray NetCDF HDF5 parallel modules. Um, and uh, see the, the Epic Wiki for details on compilation and what you need to tell the make file to compile um, this version of the code with um, NetCDF turned on. Um, so uh, in conclusion, um, the output of this um, of this ECC project is we managed to take the MPIC code, which um, only scaled up to a single node, and have um, implemented this and have parallelized this by putting it into the Monk framework, and this allows it to scale onto many thousands of cores. Um, however, there are many things we can still do to make it better, so we can improve it, its OpenMP parallelization um, and uh, replace the FFT um, solvers with some other solvers which scale better, which could scale better. Um, and then also in terms of adding in new physics to the model, we uh, could put in some realistic thermodynamics, um, precipitation and radiation, uh, improve the boundary conditions, um, and also work on better mixing methods than what we currently use, and uh, the exploitation of diagnostic of vorticity diagnostics um, and, uh, and other Lagrangian things within the uh, Monk code. Uh, I think that's all. Um, does uh, there's two things in the chat here? Right. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'd just like to say thanks to Steve and uh, Gordon for their seminar this afternoon for the webinar. So thanks very much for that. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris and Claire, for setting it up. And thanks, David, for joining and, uh, and all of you. Well, thank you, uh, Steve and Gordon, for making such a nice presentation. <laughs>